How's it going guys and welcome back to the Pilot Patriot channel. We have a really special video for you guys today, one I've been wanting to do for a really long time. Today we're looking at the US Rifle Caliber 30 M1, or as you might know it, the M1 Garand. General Patton called this gun the greatest battle implement ever devised. Now what makes this rifle so special other than the fact that it's just a beast of a battle rifle is their history of it. So before we get into the features of the gun, we're going to talk a little bit about its history. But first, if you haven't done it yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and hit that notification bell so you get notified every time we upload new videos. And make sure you give us a thumbs up, we really appreciate that. Alright, now let's get right into it. The M1 Garand was designed by John Garand. He was a Canadian born gun designer that worked with Springfield Armory. Now even though his name is John Garand, this rifle has been commonly known as the M1 Garand. Now after World War I, the US military realized that the future of warfare was going to be sheer volume of fire that you could put down range. So they decided they needed to move to a semi-automatic rifle to replace the 1903 Springfield. And John Guerin definitely delivered on this one. His design would go on to be one of the most iconic rifles in all of American history. The Garand was the first standard issue semi-automatic rifle ever issued to any military which is pretty significant considering that all of our enemies in World War II were still shooting five round bolt action rifles. That meant that we could put down a lot more firepower a lot faster. A lot of people even credit the Garand with winning World War II. I don't really know about that, but I definitely know it was a major factor and gave the American troops an advantage over their enemies. The M1 Garand was in production from 1936 to 1957 and served in two major wars, World War II and the Korean War. Some of these rifles were even used in the Vietnam War and several other conflicts around the world. Now this thing is really just a beast of a rifle. It's made of 100% American made steel and walnut. It's 43 and a half inch long with a 24 inch barrel and it weighs in right around 10 pounds. It fires a 30 alt 6 cartridge from an 8 round in block clip. And yes, I did say clip. This was important for the military because they had already been using the 30 alt 6 in the 1903 Springfield and they had a lot of surplus left over that they wanted to be used in their World War II rifles. And also, you just can't deny the knockdown power of a 30 alt 6 cartridge. The primary manufacturer of the M1 Garand was Springfield Armory. This one I have here is a Springfield Armory M1 Garand manufactured in 1945. Now the only other manufacturer that made the M1 Garand during World War II was Winchester. After World War II and going into the Korean War, they were also produced by International Harvester and Harrington and Richardson. Now there were a couple versions of this rifle, the standard infantry rifle, and then there was also a sniper version designated the M1D and the M1C. Now there were several minor changes to the standard M1 Garand over the years, but they can generally be broken down into three groups. The pre-World War II M1 Garands, or the gas trap rifles, the World War II rifles, and then the post-World War II or Korean era rifles. Now the pre-World War rifles used a gas trap system that really proved to have a lot of inherent weaknesses. So in 1940 they switched to the gas port system, which is what's on this rifle. Because of that, the gas trap rifles are very rare and can be extremely valuable to collectors. Now, the World War II rifles, like the one I have here, are some of the most sought after Garand. These rifles, manufactured from 1941 to 1945, are the rifles that fought in the jungles of the Pacific, the rifles that stormed the beaches of Normandy, and eventually invaded Germany. The men that carried this rifle in World War II were some of the bravest, toughest men that ever lived, and their rifle was the tool that delivered them to victory. Now, because of the amazing history of these rifles, the World War II Garands hold a special place in the heart of gun enthusiasts and represent a very important time in American history. Now, the post-World War rifles include any rifles produced after World War II, including the Korean War era rifles. Those rifles were produced from 1950 to 1957, and along with two new manufacturers producing the rifles, there were several small modifications made to the rifles between World War II and Korea. Some of the most notable are the improved adjustment knob on the rear sight. They got rid of the lock bar system that was on the World War II rifles. Another was a modification to strengthen the operating rod. And finally, they went to a cheaper to produce stamped trigger guard without the loop on the back. 
Now a quick note about the trigger guard. Um, they did start producing this stamp trigger guard uh, towards the end of World War II. So there are some late World War II rifles like this one that correctly have that stamp trigger guard, but every rifle produced after World War II would have that stamp trigger guard. Now the post-war rifles tend to be not quite as desirable on the collector's market, but those rifles can be some of the best shooting M1s because their components aren't as old and they had gone through all of those small modifications. Now other guns that fought alongside this during those times would be the M1 carbine, the Thompson, and of course the sidearm that you would have carried along with this rifle would be the Colt 1911. Now something else that's important to note about these rifles is throughout the life of the M1 Garand, nearly all of these rifles went through some type of re-arsenal program where after the war or during the war, as these guns got beat up or parts broken or barrels worn out, they would get sent back to the armory and they would be taken apart and re-outfitted with parts from other guns or new parts, whether it be parts from different manufacturers or parts from different eras. Now, because of that, almost every M1 Garand that you come across is gonna have some form of mix match parts on it. Some of the most common parts to be replaced would be the barrel and the stock. Oftentimes you may see a World War receiver with a Korean War barrel because of that. Now, a lot of people see that as a negative, but really each of these rifles tells a story. Every scratch, dent, and replaced part is part of that individual rifle's history. And I think that's pretty cool. For example, this rifle was manufactured in 1945. Almost all of the components are original and correct for 1945. The receiver, the barrel, and all the other smaller components are Springfield 1945 and seem to be original. But at some point during the life of this rifle, its stock was replaced. After doing a little research, I believe this to be a post-war Harrington and Richardson stock. It shows some definite battlefield use, but it's still in great condition. Now the all original, all correct rifles are the most desirable, but those are very rare. And no matter what configuration your rifle happens to be in, you can rest assured that you're holding a real piece of American history. Now, if you guys are interested in learning more about the individual parts and how to identify them, what all the cartouches and stamp marks mean, I will be doing a video on that, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Now let's get a closer look at the features of the rifle. The M1 Garand had a very durable parkerized finish on all of its metal components. And as you can see here, it has kind of a gray green look to it. Like I mentioned before, it shoots an eight round in block clip. And this clip was really innovative for its time. At the time, most rifles were still using stripper clips to push the rounds into the gun. This was pretty innovative that you could hold them all together and push that clip down into the internal magazine of the gun. And once it was fired, the empty clip would shoot out the top. Now to load this, all you do is set your clip in there. And what you're going to do is put the butt of your hand up against the back of this charging handle, hold that down and then push the clip in until it clicks and then release your hand. If the operating rod doesn't go forward on its own, you just give it a little tap and now she's ready to rock and roll. Now, most of you may have heard of the horror stories of Garand thumb. So if you do that incorrectly, there is a chance that when that bolt comes forward, it could catch your thumb if you're not holding back on that charging handle. So make sure when you're loading your clip in that you're putting some rearward pressure on that charging handle. Now, if you wanted to remove your clip manually, uh, what you can do is just pull back on the charging handle, hold it back with your hand, and then you can hit this ejector button on the side here, and that's gonna eject that clip, just like that. Another thing that's really iconic about the M1 Garand is the sound that it makes once that clip comes out. So I'll try to demonstrate that here. And that's that famous M1 Garand ping that you hear when that clip comes out. Now while we're up here, let's take a look at this rear sight. The rear sight is fully adjustable for elevation and windage. 
and you can hear those nice audible clicks every time you turn that knob like i mentioned before the rear sight knobs did go through several different variations over the years each click on these adjustment knobs equates to one inch at 100 yards the rifle does have a reciprocating charging handle and operating rod every time you fire. Most M1 Garands are going to be outfitted with a black walnut stock that's just a beautiful wood. Later in its production and some that were produced by other countries may have used a birch stock. The M1 Garand did have a very nice trigger pull as you can see here. There's just a little bit of take up there and then you hit that wall and then a very smooth break. And I will weigh that trigger pull with my Lyman scale so you can see exactly how heavy that trigger pull is. But I can tell you just by feeling it that it is a very nice trigger pull. It does have a bladed front sight with these two fins on the side to protect it. It is also adjustable. You can loosen this screw here and fade it left or right. Um, there's not much need to do that since the rear sight is already fully adjustable. Uh, you may not have to adjust that front sight. It does have a gas port system here. If you have one of those earlier rifles, this is where you would see that gas trap system. The rifle is outfitted with two sling swivels. You can see them here and here on the buttstock. This swivel up here is actually a stacking swivel, so you could stack multiple rifles together. So that's not a sling swivel there. On the back here, it does have a steel butt plate with a storage compartment here and inside that storage compartment is where they would store their cleaning kit for the rifle. Also up here at the front is the bayonet lug. That's where the bayonet would attach. It fits around the end of the barrel and clips into this lug right here. Another feature that you'll see here is the safety. Now the way that works is you just push back on that and that's on safe. Push forward and it's on fire. That is one design flaw that I can see there is that when you're on safe, to get it off of safe, you have to put your finger inside the trigger guard, but that is what it is. And real quick, one of the things that the troops really loved about this rifle is how easy it is to take down. So right here on the back of the trigger guard, what you're gonna need to do is pull back and down on that, and then that comes out, and then that whole trigger group just comes out right there. Once that's out, all you gotta do is flip it upside down. On some of them, if it's really tight, you may have to give it a little tap but the stock will come off and that gives you access to all your other components here. Now you can take this down further if you want to, but really for a regular field strip, this is all you have to do. And I'll just put it back together here so you can see how that works. You're just gonna fit that stock back into place there. It falls right in. And then you drop that trigger group back in and pull the trigger guard down until it locks and you can hear that lock there and your rifle is assembled and ready to fire. Now these rifles are becoming more and more rare as time goes on. You can still find them on the market. Uh, one of the most popular places to find them is the Civilian Marksmanship Program. You can order it through them uh, and they do tend to have very good prices. The only problem with the CMP is that it's really luck of the draw on what you get and most of their rifles are going to be a lot of mix match parts put together by the CMP, not by the original arsenal. And a lot of their rifles tend to have either brand new or sanded and refinished stocks. And that's really just not what I wanted. I wanted a rifle that was just as it was turned in from the war with all of its dents and dings and character. Something that really showed the history of the gun, not a refinished M1 that was made to look brand new. So if you're really interested in finding something like that, I definitely recommend checking your local gun shops. You can definitely find these at gun shows all around the country and some places online like gun brokers to so make sure you check those out. But of course, everyone has their own priorities, so it really just depends on what you're looking for. Now, in closing, guys, the M1 Garand was known to be a very reliable rifle. It served well in every theater of war from the frozen forests of Belgium to the deserts of Northern Africa and even in the jungles of Japan and Korea. It is robust and durable and the hard hitting 30 6 cartridge makes it extremely powerful. It was the most innovative and effective infantry rifle the world had ever seen and really just a beautiful piece of American history. Like General Patton said, I truly believe this was the greatest battle implement 
ever devised, at least until it was replaced in 1959 by the M14. Now we've gone over a lot of information here guys, but if you're interested in learning more about the M1 Garand and its history, I'm going to put a link to some great reference books in the description below, so make sure you check those out. Those are great books for collectors or really anyone that's interested in learning more about the M1 Garand or their specific M1 Garand. Now if you haven't done it yet guys, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below, give us a thumbs up, and if you want to support the channel, you can do that by joining us over at Patreon, visiting our Facebook we really appreciate that you can also visit pilotpatriotapparel.com to get yourself some really cool patriotic and second amendment t-shirts i really hope you've enjoyed this video guys and our look at one of the most iconic rifles in american history the m1 garand thanks for watching guys please like share and subscribe and we'll see you next time